Alright, time for me to suck up my pride because this Koenigsegg fanboy is about to make a video about Bugatti. And I won't promise that I still won't make fun of this car, but if I do make fun of it, I'll at least try to do it in an educational manner, still using history and facts. So get ready for the Bugatti freaking Veyron. Bugatti had quite the humble beginnings, originating from Molsheim, France, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, and they made cars for nearly a century. When 1998 rolled around, Volkswagen acquired the rights to Bugatti, thus adding some German into the mix. Volkswagen was quick to get to work as they wanted a proper successor to the EB110 and thus concepts of the Veyron had begun as early as 1999. Some of these concepts even had plans for a W18 engine, but it wasn't until 2000 where they finally settled on a W16 all-wheel drive model. This concept was called the Veyron EB16-4 concept, and it shows a lot of body language that is similar to its eventual successor. Honestly, if I saw one of these on the streets, I'd probably mistake it for a horrible replica kit car, but nope, this was indeed the legit Veyron concept. It wasn't until 2005 when the first official Veyron would be unveiled, and yes, that was 13 years ago. The Veyron is really old, and now I feel old too. The first Veyron featured an 8 liter quad turbocharged W16, which is basically just two V8s shoved together. I explained it better in this video that you should definitely check out if you're a new car enthusiast, I'll link it up here and down there. Anyways, back to the Veyron, its engine was made into a 7 speed dual clutch automatic transmission. And I'm really glad Bugatti made this decision, because the Veyron would move at such blistering speeds that a human wouldn't be able to efficiently keep up with the shifts anyway. The 2005 Veyron's massive W16 almost made 1000 horsepower, falling shy at just 987 brake horsepower and 922 pound-feet of torque. However, 987 horsepower is still an insane amount, especially for a car made in this time period. And all this power wasn't just for show, as the Veyron utilized all of it to its fullest extent in order to achieve a 0-60 time of 2.7 seconds and a world record setting top speed of 253 miles an hour or 407 kilometers an hour. And this time, I will not be speaking American only in this video, because boy oh boy did Bugatti send every other country back to the drawing board, including America. Despite weighing over 4,000 pounds or around 1,800 kilograms, it was insane to think that the Veyron could still manage such an outrageous speed. The speculation behind this lies behind Bugatti's origin of being a French automaker. France has long been known to possess an amazing skill known as retreating real fast. So when the Germans at Volkswagen realized this, they utilized their amazing engineering prowess to design a program never seen before. What a lot of people don't know is that the reason the Bugatti Veyron goes so fast is because its computer is programmed to make the car think that it's constantly retreating from enemies behind it. And thus, because of its French origin, it will instinctively run like hell as fast as possible, no matter the cost. So despite being a heavy POS, the Veyron still managed to achieve such great speed thanks to this little known secret. Yeah, that didn't take long, we're only like 3 minutes in the video and I already made fun of the Veyron. I mean, what do you expect? The inner cutting sec fanboy to me, I warned you about it, it must be quenched. All Bugattis must be defeated. <laughs> Alright, I think I'm good now. Back to the video, in actuality, the main reasons the Bugatti was able to achieve such great speed despite its weight was thanks to many factors. We've already discussed power, but we all know it takes more than power to achieve such great speeds. One of the tricks up the Veyron sleeves was its active spoiler, which would activate at 120 miles an hour, adding over 700 pounds of downforce in order to keep the Veyron well planted on the ground. Another little known fact is that the Veyron also lowers itself at the same time this wing deploys, as its ground clearance can go as low as 2.6 inches during top speed runs, to which the wing will eventually retract to prevent too much drag. The active spoiler can also deploy itself to function as an air brake, since if you're gonna go at such amazing speeds, it'll all be for nothing if the car doesn't stop in time. Aside from all these fancy gizmos, the Veyron also succeeds in an area that is often overlooked when it comes to making high-performance hypercars, which are tires. Even to this day, we still have a lot of loud-mouthed auto manufacturers who shout left and right about how their hypercar is going to be the next world-breaking 300 miles an hour hypercar, and they all they talk about is power, 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 and nothing is ever said about the tires. And let me tell you, a lot of thought has to be put into the tires to make sure the car survives the run. Especially when you consider, oh, you know, the fact that the tires are literally the ones making contact with the ground and have to withstand all the forces being applied against them while all at the same time still hauling the car's ass. Bugatti didn't for a moment underestimate the tires. They put so much thought into them that a new set of them cost 17 grand and 70 grand install. 
So even if I were a millionaire, I still wouldn't buy a Veyron since its maintenance alone would make me go broke. So why is installation so much more expensive than the tires itself? Well that's because the car has to be sent back to France in order to get them mounted. And the mounting process is different than your average street car. It wasn't long before the Bugatti Veyron became a household name, even to non-car people, because it found its way into every kid's Guinness Book of World Records and quickly filled the posters of their bedrooms. With such massive success, Bugatti knew they couldn't just stay quiet. So in 2009, Bugatti continued onwards to make a Grand Sport version, which featured a Targa top as opposed to a traditional hardtop. It still had the same top speed and blistering performance the standard version had, as long as its roof was up, otherwise if the top speed would dip down to 220 miles an hour if it went down. Honestly, I'm not really a fan of convertibles or target tops, so you know, whatever, blah blah blah, who cares? You guys probably don't care about that either, you're here to hear about real progress. And trust me, Bugatti was ready to deliver on said real progress. As just one year later in 2010, the Veyron Supersport was unveiled. The Supersport was more than just a new car with a new cut of paint and more fancy schmancy luxury features like the Grand Sport was. The Supersport featured 1200 brake horsepower and 1100 pound feet of torque, and it could do an insane top speed of 267 miles an hour or 430 kilometers an hour, making it the fastest production car and taking its throne back from the American SSC Ultimate Aero. It was clear that Bugatti was not ready to fall asleep at the wheel, and they weren't about to just give up their reign on being the world's fastest car. This was evidenced by the fact that the car even had the audacity to include World Record Edition in its name. Bugatti wasn't quite done with the Veyron nameplate yet, and it still had one more Veyron to introduce, and that came in the form of the Vitesse. The Super Vitesse was produced from 2012 to 2015, and for the most part, featured identical performance figures as the Super Sport, just with a flashier and more modernized look. The Vitesse, however, would not go on to surpass the Super Sport's record, thus making the Super Sport the fastest Bugatti to date, even as the Chiron did not quite surpass its speed, being only 261 miles an hour. So, in a way, Bugatti finally got to the point where they're struggling to outdo themselves even. Perhaps, though, they meant to do that, because Bugatti kind of changed focus, or rather they increased emphasis on a certain factor that set themselves apart from other hypercars. It's no secret that going at speeds well over 200 miles an hour must be terrifying, but many records state that the Veyron, even when going its top speed of 267 miles an hour, was still an elegant ride. It sounded great, felt great, and glided along smoothly. It truly was a level of elegance and luxury that must have taken ridiculous amounts of engineering to accomplish. Anyone can smack on lots of leather and create a car that looks luxurious. But for it to still feel luxurious, even at speeds over 250 miles an hour, is just insane. A true combination of grace and performance. As much as I love American cars, being an American myself of course, I kinda have to admit that our hypercars were outright terrifying. In my previous video about the Celine S7, I mentioned that I never really understood why critics were so harsh about it. So no matter how beautiful or sophisticated its interior was, none of that really mattered, and after researching the Veyron, I think I finally understand why critics came to that conclusion. It's because everyone else in the world are just freaking pussies. It's like they say, the closer to death you are, the more alive you feel. Anyways, lame jokes aside, the S7 was known to be terrifying at high speeds. The Hennessy Venom GT has the same issue. Honestly, I don't even know why it's called GT, as nothing about it is grand touring at all. The Venom GT was also stated to be a terrifying car to drive, scaring people right to the core. And something, it always just feels like American cars want to kill you, much like how the Dodge Viper also has that. Either American auto manufacturers really just have a death wish, or perhaps we probably don't know what it really means to make a car successful of properly being deemed a hypercar. Perhaps high performance alone doesn't really make a car a hypercar. If you really think about it, if we were just after performance, why even bother making a street car? Just make a race car. The moment you make a production car, it has to strike a balance between feeling alive but still being practical. As Americans, we saw luxurious features to just be overcomplicated and a waste of weight. But when you really think about it, I think Bugatti had something going, and I think they were in the right mindset. But even in spite of that, I think America will continue onward to do the stupid things we do, because at the end of the day, it's part of the American spirit to feel free. And part of that freedom means feeling the full force of all the brutality that comes with hypercar speeds. 
Regardless, it appears that Bugatti is no longer alone in their pursuit, as Koenigsegg has recently learned to mix grace and performance as well, while also making their cars not look like driving eggs, despite actually being called Koenigseggs, they don't look like eggs, unlike Bugattis, which literally look like driving eggs. I don't think they're ugly, but they're, they're, to me they're not stylistically gorgeous either. And I guess it's at this point in the video where I state that I don't actually hate Bugatti. I just joke about it. I think of them kind of as a brotherly rivalry between Koenigsegg and Bugatti. And who am I kidding? The fanboys have already commented in the comment sections how they hate my guts, but whatever. If you're still here though, know this. I respect Bugatti, and I think everyone else should too, and I think every other Koenigsegg fanboy or any hypercar fanboy should respect Bugatti. Because at the end of the day, they were the forerunners of insane performance, and without their insane pursuits, I don't think Koenigsegg, Hennessy, or any other manufacturer for that matter, would have pushed as hard as they did to dethrone them. Competition creates innovation and demands progress, and a world of forward movement is one that I can get behind, and in order for that world to exist, competition needs to exist. So I need the Bugatti Veyron to exist, I need the Bugatti Chiron to exist, for the same reason that I want the Koenigseggs to exist. Although, time has definitely changed, and the tables have turned, as it looks like this time, Bugatti will be playing catch up with Koenigsegg. I hope these two companies keep trading punches as the decades go by, and I hope other manufacturers join as well. And I hope they continue to create cars that will inspire future generations of car enthusiasts, just like how the Veyron did to ours. Hey guys, Blade Angel here, and thank you for watching this video. It took a lot longer to make this than my other freaking cars video. Sorry for my voice, by the way. I am just feeling sick, not feeling great. But, you know, I, I'm gonna get better. I'm gonna get to your other uh, suggestions. So, like always, please leave suggestions behind. I will get to them slowly but surely. I will get to them. So, if you love this video series, please like, share, and subscribe so I can keep on doing it because I love this video series too. As always, though, see y'all next time. Blade Angel out.